before the common era or something AD, I forget what they say, but the world tries to take away from the knowledge that Jesus is alive. And Jesus not only is alive, but he walked this earth and changed the futures and the natures of mankind. Yes, you know, our nature was changed when Jesus walked this earth because we were not able to, to follow the first and greatest commandment before Christ. Although we were commanded to do it, to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, and strength, we couldn't do it. We couldn't do it because the flesh would get in the way. We were not righteous before God. Our sins were, were covered in, in blood of animal sacrifices, but they weren't cleansed from us. Though through God's grace, he, he made a way. You know, there's just as much grace in the Old Testament as there is in the New. We've always been in an age of grace, per se, like that. But the covenant and the, and the, the payment was paid for. It was, we were purchased with his blood on Calvary. And on that third day, he resurrected. Now, this isn't an Easter sermon. I'm, you know, that's about a month, another month away we're talking about. But because of the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin, that we're now able to be inhabited by the Spirit of God, be temples of the Holy Ghost, that means that we now are capable of loving him with all of our heart, all of our soul, all of our strength. And if that's the case, We've got to understand that God doesn't do anything just to do that. He has a purpose in all of it. Even there might be small things that God's done in your life that might not be tremendous in somebody else's life, but they mean a lot to you. And why did he do it? Well, he loves you. And he wanted to, to encourage you in that. He wanted to show you that. He wanted to make a mark in your life, to testify of it. He wanted to bring you closer to him. There's a lot of reasons why God did it, but he did it for a reason. He just does not throw things out there and see where they fall. That's not who he is. He's not the author of confusion. So if we've received all of this from God, we receive this indwelling of the Spirit of God. And I'm gonna get to, I'll get to the scripture later on to give you that one. But we've received all of this, and he's done all of this for us. What's the point? What's the purpose? Now, this is where the crossroads is for a Christian. Now, People who aren't saved, you know, this is a different story. Because they need to come to the, to the knowledge. They need to come to the blood of Jesus Christ. They need to come to Calvary. They need to be saved. They need to be saved from hell, eternal damnation. But we who know him, we who have accepted him, we who serve him, we who have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit inside of us, we are at a crossroads decision. That crossroads decision is deciding how we are going to serve him in this life and what is our purpose in his eyes, in the living that we do. See, God has a purpose for all of us. Yeah, right. He just doesn't create, he didn't create us and just throw us out there. He has a purpose for each one of us. And what God does is he reveals that to us when we're ready, one step at a time. But we're talking about God living inside of us and Jesus coming so many years ago. Coming to the earth so many years ago. And how did he come to the earth? And why did he come to the earth? Well, it was, it was, you know, men wouldn't say that it was the best time. But for God, it was the perfect time. It was the perfect time for him to come when he did. And it was in the most trouble. You know, they had a lot of trouble going on in the world at that time. Turmoil. Uh, bondages. You know, things happening. Uh, and, and the Roman government was an iron boot on the neck of the Jews. It was an iron boot on the neck of everybody in the world. There was a lot of trouble, a lot of bondages, a lot of things happening going on. Paganism rampant. And yet, this is the world that Jesus came into. And, you know, his own didn't receive him. But yet, when he came there, the world changed. So why did he come when he did? I don't know how, I don't have all these answers. I can look in the Bible, I can see the prophecies that point to the very moment when he's supposed to be born. I can, I can look at the prophecies and see the place where he was supposed to be born, who he, was supposed to, who he was supposed to be, what he was going to accomplish. I can look at prophecies in the Old Testament and see that. But as a man, I look at the timing and I'm thinking in my head, well, you know, if he would have came at a different time, you know, he wouldn't have had all of these problems and all this trouble. People would have received him and, 
And the world would have been changed politically or whatever, but that wasn't God's plan. God's plan was totally different than our plan. God's plan has to do with eternity. You know, we don't comprehend eternity, but God's plan does. And so he sent him at the perfect time in a world full of trouble. Yes, amen. And we're thankful for it. But we still got a world full of trouble. You know, there's a lot of things going on in this world. A lot. We talk about school shootings and, and, and you know, here in Kentucky, uh, the school shooting we had a few weeks ago. And then down in Florida, the school shooting they had. And, and in Las Vegas, not too long ago, the mass shootings they had. And those are just shootings. That's not, that's not talking about all the people who are killed. You know, in, in different ways. Look at Chicago. You know, it's, it's worse there than it is in Iraq. Well, our act's better now than it was before. There's turmoil all over the world. There are rotten, terrible things going on. You know, we, we see people who, you know, when they speak and they talk about how they see the future, well, how did you get that? Why would you want to destroy the family structure? Why would you want to do this and this and this? We can't understand that because it doesn't make sense. It doesn't instill life in the future. We live in a world that is in turmoil. You know, when you have a disagreement with somebody, they brand you as a racist or something because you don't agree with them. That's crazy. So where's Jesus? Now, that's the thing, like I said about God. God has a purpose in everything. God sent Jesus at a time when there was the most turmoil that there could possibly be. And he changed the world. Of course, God in flesh. The word was made flesh. Right, Twelve amongst we beheld his glory. As the only God of the Father, full of grace and truth, we beheld him. The word made flesh. People have to take notice of the word made flesh. Yes. When God's presence comes in the room, changes take place. The people accept or they reject Stephen. He lost his life. Stephen, the, 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 uh, the deacon, but the first century church, he lost his life and God's presence with, with him strong. But even through his death, he, it shook the world and it changed and people came to Christ. Because what he believed and what he stood for was worth dying for. We still live in a terrible world. You know, we look at creation, we can see God through the veil. It's sort of like an old painting, right? When it's been around and it's gotten dirty through the years. And you can look at it and, you know, it's still, it's still pretty, but you can see the dirt. And you wonder what it looked like before it got dirty. Now, that's creation. We can see God's handiwork in it, yet, you know, things have gotten dirty through the years. But yet you can still see God in it. The presence of God is undeniable in creation. The presence of God is undeniable in the world. Although it's, it, 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 it's, it's something that you know, we recognize it, and we can see it more clearly as Christians. We recognize it, but the problems and sin in this world have sort of clouded it to where we say it's a fractured world we live in now. It's not what God created, but it became fractured through sin. So the world has been even worse than it is today. There was a flood. We haven't had the world covered in flood because we're here. Our ancestors went through that. But God hasn't destroyed the world since then. So it has been worse. But it is pretty bad now. So what's God's thinking about all this? What's his, what's his plan about all this? What does he do with all of this? And that's where we have to look at ourselves. And this is the, the other problem that the church has as a whole. And that is that we definitely, we look toward God, but we don't look toward God in ourselves. We look toward God, and we know that he has power. We know that he's real. We know that he exists, and we're faithful to him. But we don't look at God in ourselves as to how he wants to use us to change the world. 
Now that's crippling to the church. You know, the demons in hell, they acknowledge God as God. They don't serve him, but they acknowledge his existence. And so God has called us to a different existence, a different plane, a different responsibility. To much whom much is given, much is required. And we have received the indwelling of the Spirit of God. I can't comprehend that. God's living inside of me. He's living inside of you. Literally. You know, it's sort of like, you know, we just, we hear that, say, okay, we can't really understand it, but we accept it and go on. And then once in a while we stop and we think how big that is. So we acknowledge God's existence. Serving, you know, maybe being faithful in church, prayers, these kinds of things, whatever it happens to be, talk to him personally. Well, what about God in us? What about God changing the world because all that we've received was not intended to be set upon a shelf? And God is someone who addresses needs. He answers prayer. You know, he does, he answers prayer. He sends deliverance. You know, the, the, the cries of the, the children of Israel, the, the Hebrews called, cried up to him. They said, Moses, he hears things. He, he works changes. But he works changes through people. Now, he has the ability to part Red Sea. But he has chosen to use people to bring differences in this world. All of us are here because of number one, God, and number two, he used somebody. Now that somebody might have been a preacher in a pulpit, might have been a family member that witnessed to us like a buddy might, someone who was just impressed to put a track in a phone booth. We don't have any phone booths these days. But when we did, there was a track in one of them that my buddy found. Got saved. God used somebody. And he hasn't changed that. He's always done that. He looks for someone. He searches for someone who's willing. You know, Mary, when Jesus came into the earth and the Word made flesh, he came through Mary. And she's a good girl. You read now, I think it's Luke, the first chapter. Oh, yeah, yeah, Luke, the first chapter. You read the story there in Luke, the first chapter, and, and the Luke... 1, 26 through 27 says, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And when we read that story, you know, we read it on Christmas. We, we, we read it not too long ago here in the church. And I love that, the way that the nativity is played out in, in the Gospel of Luke. But Mary just wasn't pulled off of the street. She wasn't just randomly picked out. She had been used by God. She was used by God because of who she was to the Lord. She found favor with him. You read that in the first chapter, and Gabriel says, and you found favor with God. Her life before the Lord was able to receive what God wanted to do in this earth. She was a willing vessel, you know, and even when she knew that what God was asking her to do was going to tear up her family. Because the angel didn't appear to Joseph. Didn't appear to her parents. Didn't appear to the rest of her family. Didn't appear to the people in town. So she's going to be this young girl who comes up pregnant. Who is betrothed to another man. Anybody sees a problem with that. Now God did. And Joseph, he saw a problem with it. In fact, he was a good man. He was going to put her away. Privately, he didn't want to make a spectacle of her. And he had to have an angelic visitation also. But the thing in her was, was conceived of the Holy Spirit. And her, she was, she was a bright girl. She was a sharp girl. You want to see how Mary conducted herself. You look at in the miracle of Canaan and Galilee, she was in charge of that. And Jesus basically used her to tell everybody else to gather vessels together and things. She said, you do what he says to do. She was sharp. And when she was approached by Gabriel then, she knew 
said there was going to be problems. She wasn't a naive little girl. She could see things clearly. But she loved God more than her life. And so she said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord. Do what's according to your will. Do what you want to do, God. She was willing. And as a result, you know, we're in this church. God used her. Definitely, she had a lot of suffering in her life also, especially having to see him on the cross. But the Lord took care of her and gave her to John. Told her to take her into his home. Said, she's your mother now. Took care of her. So how did Jesus come to the earth? He came to the earth through Mary. See, God chooses people. And in a world that is in such turmoil, He's not going to reach his hand down from heaven and move it like this. He's going to reach his hand down from heaven and outside of us and turn it like this. Yes. He's going to reach out of us because we possess the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. We're living tabernacles of the Lord. Right. We haven't been saved to be wallflowers or put on, the, put on a trophy pedestal. We've been saved as working vessels. Yes. Right. Definitely pretty. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, hey, if you have, if you're a Christian, you shine. One way or another. You might shine like a copper pot, or you might shine like a diamond, but you shine. Yes, man. Because of Jesus shining through you. So where is he? He's right here. And what God has ordained the church to do is not just to be faithful. By no means. That's what the devil wants the church to do. You know, you're no threat to the devil just by being a Christian and loving God. You're a threat to the devil when you put an action on that. We're not a threat to the devil when we know our doctrine and we want to make sure our, our I's are dotted and our T's are crossed. We're a threat to the devil when we start telling people, you know something? Jesus can change your life. It's going into the enemy's camp and taking back what he stole. So the world's in turmoil. And what does God want to do? God wants to change it. Absolutely. That's what the word says. He's not willing that any perish, but I'll come to repentance. You know, I'm a pastor. I'm not a prophet, right? I'm, you know, I'm somewhat familiar with prophetic scripture. Somewhat familiar. We should all be somewhat familiar, but I'm not a prophetic scholar, so to speak. If I need to teach something on, on prophetic things, I, I research it. I, I try to, 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 to get several resources and bring them together and try to see what, what God would have me to share. So I'm not a prophetic scholar, so to speak. But I believe that what God wants to reveal to us personally is not just the prophetic of what's going to happen. But most importantly, he wants to reveal to us that what's going to happen right now. Yeah. It doesn't do the world any good if we know what the days are going to come or going to take place. If we're not occupying until he comes. It doesn't do the world any good if we know what Revelation says down to the very brass tacks of it and can, can decipher every small bit of prophecy and relation and symbol and... Uh, and uh, uh, symbolism or and literal things that are there. We can we can break it all apart and bring in the Old Testament. It's wonderful, but what are you doing now? What have you done lately? Is what God speaks to us today. You might know the future, but what are you doing in the present? Teaching the future is not good enough. We should share things of the future and give people the answer for today. There's a lot of people, a lot of Christians that are so involved in the things to come, and we should be familiar with them. I believe in the rapture that is going to take place. I believe in the premillennial. Uh, I, I, I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. I believe in that strongly. I believe in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ at the end of that tribulation to yes. come for a thousand years and we rule and reign with him. I believe in all of that. But also what I believe is that people have become so fixated that we have stopped being productive today. We'll follow after teachers. We'll follow.
follow after, wanting to know all the very specific and all the deep things in the, in the Word. And, you know, there's always fruit in that. But we cannot forsake people who need to know that Jesus is alive and working now. Because the world's in turmoil. We don't need to sit back as Christians and say, well, the Lord's coming anyway. We'll just let the world go to hell. Because it will. What God's calling us today as a church is to see things as he does. And how does Jesus see things? The miracles he performed, the word tells us he had compassion on them. And I got to work with that. I have to work on my compassion. I was talking, I was talking to Terry before church today. I was talking to him. And it really had to do about me and my compassion. I had to just make sure that I did not forget compassion in, uh, in different ways. But what are we doing now? Because the Word was made flesh, and it came through Mary. So if the indwelling of the Spirit of the Lord is in us, what is God going to do through us? Because apparently he's intended to do something. Now, Billy Graham has gone on to be with the Lord. I'm not saying he's going to make us Billy Graham. But that was when ministry God did through one, did through one man. Yes. It is no more important or less important than anything that we're doing. Right. You know, we all have come into this the same way. The same gate. We all have the same Lord. He has the same ability. In each one of us. And we've all been called to different purposes and different parts of the body of Christ. What our responsibility is knowing that we are active in that part of the body that he's called us to be. But also understanding that God has called us into this world to represent him as an ambassador. That we carry the spirit of God with us. That's why we lay hands on the sick. We say in the name of Jesus be healed. That's why if there are demon possessed people, we cast them out in Jesus name. That is why when we listen to somebody and we tell them about our testimony, we have the authority and the standing to share with them what Jesus Christ can do because he did it here. We've been commissioned. We've been empowered. We have been indwelt with the Spirit of God. There is no demon, hell, there's no witch, there's no occult uh, coven that can do anything to any of you. Because you're sealed by the Holy Ghost. Yes, you're a child of God. You are enjoined with Him. You have power over them. That's why the Antichrist cannot be revealed until the church is gone. Because we have the power to rebuke Him in Jesus' name. Yes, why have we been given all of this? Because there's souls that need to know that Jesus Christ walks this earth. Right. And He walks it through us. That's all. That's I can't wrap my head around that, but that's how it is. We are a church that is destined to turn the world upside down. Not just locally here in Paris. I believe God's going to do tremendous things. But the church in the world is appointed to turn the world upside down. Now we can't speak for them, and we can't speak for each other. But we can speak for ourselves. That's for me and my house. We'll serve the Lord. Yes, amen. The last scripture I'm going to give you is Matthew 11, 2 through 5. So when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? And Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you see and hear and see. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. So, after people come in contact with us, what do they report that they hear and see? Saying, Lord. You know, Jesus didn't do all of those things in one place. And you know, we are not called to do everything at one time. What we're called to do is be available to do anything, anytime. Right. And 
what are people going to see and hear after they come in contact with us? As a church, there should be absolutely nobody, even if they hate our gut, that would come through those doors and not leave knowing that the, that the Spirit of God's in this house. That's undeniable. But the Spirit of God's in this house, in this house not to be a metal. He's a working Lord. He doesn't sit back on the laurels. He touches hearts. People feel that presence of God. They feel the spirit that God's been in you so that the Lord can tell them that he's no respecter of person. And what we've got, they can have. What are they seeing here? They should see and hear Jesus Christ out of each one of us. No matter who we are, no matter what we've been through, no matter where we're going, they should see Jesus Christ in each one of us. And when they leave, lame walk, blind see, deaf hear. But most importantly, the gospel is preached to the poor. I, I just want to tack this on a little bit. Gospel is preached to the poor. You know why that's so important? Because the poor can't give you nothing. They can't give you nothing. We get the most precious thing in your life and my life you want to give to them. That's why the gospel is preached to the poor. And I'm so glad it was preached to me. Amen. But you know something? We might be we're going, we might be poor. We might not have two pennies to rub together sometimes. But like my daddy, when he was a little boy in Harlan, Kentucky. Well, this is Kentucky, you know where Harlan is. <laughs> and he had an evangelist that came to the church there. And they were singing a, an old hymn that said, I'm a millionaire. And this guy, he was happy, man. He was stomping his feet up on the platform. He was lifting them up like this. And every time Daddy said he lifted up, there was a hole in the bottom of his shoe, the side, the shoe beside the silver. <laughs> I had a newspaper in there. Singing, I'm a millionaire. I'm a millionaire. But isn't that the truth of it? Amen. You know something? We are wealthy in heaven. Amen. And we're wealthy here in the spirit of the Lord. You can't buy the presence of God. You can only receive it. And we've received it, and freely we've been given, and freely we'll be poured out again. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand. Thank you, God. I'm a millionaire. I'll look that song up. I've learned that. You know, small things like that sort of stick in your head. Isn't that the truth? Of it? What God's done. God's done wonderful things here among us. He's going to continue to do greater things. But our greatest testimony is what he's doing with people that come in here. Yes. But most importantly, what he's going to do with people who live around you. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to tell you something. I'm not going to put him on the spot or anything. Justin shared a testimony with us. And, and I'm going to tell you, that was just that was because of the testimony of what God's done in your life and in your family's life. That was because of that. And that's something to be thankful to the Lord for, that he shines so greatly through your lives. And, and that's the thing. People, people know it. You can't hide it. You know, a hypocrite, eventually a hypocrite, you're going to know they're a hypocrite. No doubt about it. Uh, I mean, if somebody says that uh, they can drive like Richard Petty, but you see them wrapped around telephone poles the whole time, they're probably a hypocrite. But people know. They know the Spirit of God in you. They know it. It's a great testimony. God's going to use that. He's going to use it in our church. He's going to use it in your homes. In your workplaces. And I'm encouraged with that. Nobody can do